I am Mitch, and welcome to the Restoration Road. My guest today is my good friend, Nate Tatman. Nate will transparently and authentically share his incredible story of how God took him from a personal tragedy to be used by him to bring his restoration to a lost and hurting world. Nate, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. You are Mission Advancement Pastor at County Line Church of God, where I've been my whole life. I think Stewie and my great-great-grandfather co-founded it 122 years ago or something like that. And Sounds about right. Yeah, I, you, uh, we weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> Although as every year goes by, you kind of wonder. Um, you have an amazing story. You have an amazing heart for God. You've done incredible things. You've been all over the world. And uh, I, wanna, uh, I want our audience to hear your story and how God has led you to these amazing things and then the big finish where you're headed next. <laughs> um, talk about uh, growing up and uh, what life was like and how you interpreted faith. Yeah, so grew up in a Christian home. Um, the way I usually, or where I usually start that story is my mom grew up in a very conservative Mennonite home and my dad grew up in a nominal Catholic home and they met in an Assemblies of God church in Kinderville. <laughs> that sounds like so, a David Dean joke. <laughs> so it's not a joke, it really happened. And uh, so my, uh, my upbringing was actually going to, to church at uh, Assemblies of God in Kinderville, Indiana. And uh, from, uh, boy, elementary on up, my parents were involved in the church, a lot of uh, lay leadership type positions, um, teaching Sunday school, uh, leading worship, uh, part of the elders, that sort of thing. So, so yeah, I grew up in a very, I guess, a very normal for me or what seemed to be a normal loving family household and, and, uh, grew up going to church and we, and we, we moved around from church to church, uh, not really settling in any one specific denomination or anything like that. So. How'd you end up, uh, at DeKalb High School then? So we moved to Auburn. Um, my fifth grade year, I believe it was, sorry, my third grade year. And uh, we, um, um, my parents wanted to be closer to their family, uh, to their parents. And so, yeah, moved to elementary school and uh, pretty much from then on through high school, uh, I grew up in Auburn, graduated from DeKalb. You had a story, mm -hmm. an occurrence in your life that uh, really became life altering. I'd like you to kind of give me the backdrop of it and then and share what happened that day. Yeah, so it was back in 1996, uh, summer of 96, and um, I was 20 years old at the time, been married. Uh, we got married in January, uh, and uh, we had our son, our firstborn son, Dylan, in July. And about six weeks later, I was in a diving accident, and I, uh, um, was dove into a pool, an above ground pool, something I'd done many, many times before. In that exact pool. In that exact mm -hmm. pool. But 20 years old, athlete, I was invincible. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing was gonna hurt me. If anything bad was ever gonna happen, it was always gonna happen to somebody else. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't happen to me, um, but it happened to me. And uh, uh, hit my head on the bottom of the pool. And um, uh, long story short, I fractured my first and second vertebrae. Um, and uh, never suffered any paralysis, never uh, went unconscious or, or anything like that. And uh, yeah, that was definitely a, a life altering uh, moment uh, for me and, and my family as well. Um, was it early that same morning that your grandmother sensed a strong prompting? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was not walking with the Lord at that time. So we, um, like I had mentioned, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, kind of went the rebellious way throughout the high school years as many teenage teenagers do um, and was still not walking with the Lord at that time and felt prompted, felt convicted. But I was just always telling God, you know, when I start my family, when, you know, when I get to this certain point in my life, I'll, I'll follow you. I'll, I'll do all those things that I know I should be doing. But for right now, I'm gonna, I wanna live life the way I do. And looking back on it, it was just, it was all about control. I wanted to be able to control my life and felt like, um, felt like, you know, 
giving my life over to Christ, I was losing that control. And so was not walking with the Lord. Um, this was a Sunday afternoon when I had my diving accident. So earlier that morning, my grandmother, uh, she woke up out of her sleep and uh, just felt prompted to pray for a family member. Um, she had, as, you know, she was a prayer warrior. She had always been a prayer warrior for our family. Um, woke up out of her sleep, didn't know who it was for, didn't know why she was supposed to pray, but just felt like God was was asking her to pray. So she prayed and, and um, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know why um, things turned out the way they did. Um, you know, whether it was my dumb decision to, to dive into that pool, uh, but for whatever reason, I was able to walk out of that pool without, without any major, you know, paralysis or uh, anything like that. And so it, it, it's, it, it has been a marker for me in my life to be able to look back and point back to that, that day. And my grandmother um, obeying that prompting, praying, um, and many, many, many other people praying throughout that day once they found out I was in an accident and, and going to the hospital and everything, so. You uh, didn't have paralysis, but it wasn't a cakewalk either. Can you talk about what happened medically then with you? Yeah, so I got out of the pool and immediately knew. I mean, when I when I hit when my head hit the bottom of the pool, I mean, I I my you know it's, there was like a, a flash, and I knew something had happened, but I could move. I wasn't you know I was alert. I was aware, and uh, got out of the pool started rubbing the back of my neck and I went inside and I told my wife what happened and immediately she, immediately she was like, you know, we need to call an ambulance, get to the hospital. I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'm walking. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I, I just jammed my neck. And so I was actually rubbing my neck and uh, probably within about 15 minutes, my neck just stiffened up. Um, to where I was getting very worried. It's like, okay, this is more than just a jammed neck. And uh, so I, I said, okay, maybe we should go to the hospital. So I actually got in the car. Uh, she drove us to a local hospital um, and went very, very slow as the pain was increasingly getting worse. And uh, any little bump, um, it was just, it was jarring. Mm. Got to the hospital. Um, and uh, she went inside and told them what had happened. And, and uh, the receptionist was like, okay, bring him in. You know, no, no stretcher, no wheelchair, no nothing. I mean, I was, I was very stiff, very, uh, it was a very delicate moment looking back at it. And so she was, Stacy was like, well, you know, can you at least get a wheelchair? And they pointed to one in the corner and said, yeah, there's a wheelchair right over there. So <laughs> Stacy, <laughs> Stacy had to go get the wheelchair, roll it out to the car, get me into the wheelchair, went into the waiting room <laughs> with, with, uh, uh, my neck in that situation and uh, had, to, had to go get the car, pull it back in the parking lot, come back in, wait with me. And um, what eventually got back to the, to the, to see the ER doctor. And so it was a Sunday afternoon. There wasn't a radiologist uh, on staff. And so the ER doctor took the x-rays, read the x-rays, misread the x-rays mm. And sent me home and said that I would probably miss a few days of work. Um, just keep some ice and heat packs on it, and eventually you can go back to work. I'll write you a, a work release note. So we we're like, okay, this seems a little bit, to be a little bit more than just a jammed neck, you know. And and uh, went back. You're uh, doing construction work at the time, right? Yeah, at, Springfield? at that time, I was doing construction work for my for mm -hmm. my uncle Dan at Springfield Enterprises. Somebody did a really good job on the eve spouting on my house. Yeah, was that, that you? That would have been me. That's what I that thought. That would have been me. Do they still work? They still work. Okay, yeah, that was me. <laughs> um, and uh, so went back to the house, tried to lay down, couldn't. I mean, it, I was in such agony. I think I was probably crying because the pain was so bad at that point. Um, and Stacy was like, we need to go get a second opinion. So we drove to a, a different hospital. Um, and before we got there, we just confirmed with my mother-in-law, she was with us at the time and just said, let's not, you know, let, let's not make them aware that we already went to a hospital. And so we drove up to uh, the ER doors at this hospital. My wife went in to tell them what had happened. 
and uh, immediately they rush out with a team of doctors and nurses um, with a stretcher and, and everything. And, and as they were coming out, I was actually walking out of the van and they were like, what are you doing? <laughs> you should not be walking, moving, anything. I was like, okay. So, uh, so I, I ended up getting out of the van and right there, they put the stretcher board, um, uh, applied the stretcher board to me, tied me down, brought me back, uh, wheeled me in, um, took two sets of x-rays and confirmed that I had fractured my first and second vertebrae. Uh, so for about a month, um, I wore the halo apparatus and, um, wasn't quite healing the way that they wanted it to. So I had to go in for surgery uh, where they took bone out of my hip and uh, fused it with my first and second vertebrae. So, uh, so for since 96, um, I've had uh, what looks like a stiff neck to many people and still play basketball, like I mentioned, and active in other sports and things like that. And I've just had to, had to adjust um, with, with my fused neck. So. Well, this becomes a pivotal moment for you. And uh, I think your uncle uh, was at Central church mm -hmm. and Pastor Don Delagrange comes into the hospital mm -hmm. and how does that encounter go? Yeah, so I'm laying in the hospital bed that night, same night of the accident, and my uncle, uh, who I was working for and we were renting the house from at the time, he, first of all, he comes in and says, we checked your answer machine and the other hospital called and said that we needed to get to an ER immediately, um, which we had already taken care of, obviously, but, um, but also Pastor Don Delagrange from Central um, Church came in and, um, and that was uh, a moment where, again, much like the accident, that was, it was just a continuation of this is a, uh, a point in my life where I knew that I had to stop running from God, um, that uh, I realized my life was not about me and that it was more than just me. It was, first of all, it was very real. You know, it was about my wife and my son at the time who was six weeks old that had something really happen to me. Um, you know, I would have left, left them uh, without a father or, you know, had I suffered paralysis or, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, to take care of me and, and our son. So um, there's that. And then just the other aspect, the spiritual component of that, that um, I realized that, that again, this, this life, this uh, journey that we're on, um, again, it's not about me, it's not about us. It's about what God has done in us and, and what he wants to do through us. And um, it was at that moment that I gave my life to Christ and realized that, um, you know, my life was, was not about me. It was about following his calling on my life and the purpose that he had for me as a husband, as a father, uh, as a man. And it began a thirst for the scriptures for mm -hmm. you? Yeah. I think, yeah. You, I think you fell in love with Acts. Yeah, yeah. The book of Acts is my favorite book of the Bible. And I, I dug into that deeply um, and, and uh, would study scripture before I'd go to work in the morning. And, um, and that really, through that process then, um, began working out what I was sensing a call into full-time vocational ministry. And so, Praise the Lord. Um, um, and that's, that was kind of a, that was a turning point or stepping point, I guess, where just kind of dipping my toes in the water a little bit. We, we started volunteering at, uh, within the youth group at Central Ministries um, with Brian Gary, was a youth pastor at that point. Um, became a part-time youth director at a Methodist church in Fremont. You're getting all the denominations. I'm getting, bases I'm getting all my here. bases covered. Make sure, <laughs> make sure I'm good at every every aspect. In the um, words of Elvis, I don't want to get kicked out of heaven on a technicality. <laughs> I never heard that. I like that. <laughs> I'm surprised Stewie hasn't told you that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and then eventually became a full time youth pastor at First Mennonite Church in Bern, Indiana. So um, the the for three years, probably the only time we lived outside of of either DeKalb or Allen County uh, was in Adams County for for that position. So. And you were taking Bible classes mm -hmm. at Taylor Fort Wayne. At yeah, that time. yeah. So when I took on that position uh, at, at in Bern, um, I knew that it. It could just be experience alone. I was still rather young at the time. I, I think I would have been uh, 21, 22 at that time. I I'd, I'd taken some uh, college courses, but again, at that time of my life, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know where I wanted to go. Um, 
and so I enrolled at Taylor University and eventually uh, graduated after 11 years with uh, with a bachelor's in business administration awesome. and a minor in Christian ministries. Awesome. So um, I watched you play basketball, but I uh, had sold my business. I was volunteering full time as a teaching pastor at Blackhawk Ministries and this cool dude kind of struts in my office and says that he's got a calling from God. He's doing something kind of cool. You want to tell me what that was? Yeah, so um, when we went to Bern, I remember Stacy saying she never wanted to move back to Auburn. And um, and that was probably the writing on the wall that eventually we'd move back to Auburn, mm-hmm. and we did. We uh, I was in Bern for about three years, and just, again, uh, working out my calling and what God was calling us to and was, you know, first full-time vocational job in the church. Um, Nothing against the church I was at, but became very frustrated with how internally focused the church, and not just that church, churches all over, um, how internally focused churches are and and had become. And my heart just really um, was... uh, compassionate for those who had never had the opportunity to walk into the uh, doors of a church or would never be interested in walking into the doors of the church. And so just began um, wrestling with that and um, led us to opening up a coffee shop and uh, a youth center, two separate entities. Um, We started at the same time. I don't know why, but, (laughs) you know, looking back, that was probably not a smart move, but we did it. That was the powerhouse. And uh, it was the powerhouse youth center and Joshua Cup Coffee. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually, uh, those two entities uh, changed over. We we started those with through the that organization, and then we ended up uh, taking over as owners of uh, Joshua Cup Coffee, and it became Brew Daily's, and uh, the Powerhouse Youth Center became the DeKalb County Youth Center, and uh, we we did the Youth Center I think total for about three or four years, and the coffee shop stayed open for about five years. Uh, until the recession hit and Starbucks moved into town and, and all that good stuff. Yeah, so. that's probably over. But, uh, but yeah, that, that was a time where um, it allowed us the opportunity to focus on building relationships with people who would never walk inside the church doors. Which you're very good at. How do you end up at County Line Church? So it, it, through that, um, my... Um, Again, this whole thing with wrestling with my calling, uh, I felt God calling us back into the church, but with this new um, new perspective on church doesn't have to be about staying internally focused. Multiplying about, what you had experienced yeah, in other people. Yeah, and so um, I had secretly started um, putting my name in um, with other churches and looking for uh, get, to get getting back into a church full-time vocationally. And... Um, running into dead ends. And one day a guy uh, named Dane Cruz uh, walked into the coffee shop and said that uh, County Line had this position that they were searching, um, you know, to fill. And every time they talked about this position, my name would always come up in Dane's head. Uh, Mm. And he had no idea what we were experiencing, what we were going through, what I was wrestling with. And uh, he walked in shared this and uh, he said, actually, I got a job description. And I was like, great, I'll, I'll read it. And, uh, and I said, actually, and I you know, talked to him about, I've been, been sending out my resumes to other churches. I've got a resume, here it is. And it, it lined up my passions, um, my, what I felt was my calling, my strengths, my wiring, just matched up with, with that job description and, and as community life pastor at County Line. And so in 2007, I came on staff at County Line. And you have been a blessing to all of us. Uh, You got your master's in leadership from Indiana Wesleyan Mm -hmm. University. Um, But after several years of probably saying yes to everything, uh, you notice that you have some anxiety from Mm overcommitment. Can you share what was going on inside you? Yeah, it, it, as you said, um, I found myself just saying yes to a lot of things, both within County Line, outside of County Line, with the uh, state ministry, with the... Uh, our missions agency for the Church of God and just found myself becoming overextended and um, 
didn't recognize that until it was too late and I started started having some anxiety issues um, to the point where I couldn't even go to church on a Sunday morning. Mm. I just, I found myself uh, paralyzed with fear, um, in, internal fear um, of, you know, what, everything just got blown out of proportion within my mind, you know, in terms of, um, you know, making people upset, not meeting people's expectations, different things like that. And that, that just began to spiral, um, out of control for me and started getting some counseling. And fortunately at that time, our ministry leadership team was talking about, uh, starting a sabbatical policy at the church. And they, they really expedited that, um, finalizing that so that I could go on a sabbatical, which, I absolutely needed. Um, in fact, I, I, I've had counselors tell me I probably would not be in ministry or would not have been able to continue on in ministry had I not been able to step away, get healing, um, find restoration and and be able to be prepared to go back into to ministry again, so. Because God's got an amazing plan yeah. for you. I, I would yeah. say then one of the biggest that happened out of that was you and Stacy were both sensing um, a prompting from the Holy Spirit for adoption. Yeah. Uh, you wanna talk about yeah, these so, two special girls? Um, so just before, uh, about a year prior to me um, dealing with this anxiety and going on my sabbatical, we had, as you said, we had kind of felt God prompting us and calling us to, to adopt. And uh, for anybody that's gone through the adoption process knows it's a long, strenuous process from uh, just the application part to the background checks, the psyche valves, all that kind of stuff. I mean, they, they really, you know, do a good job in, in um, covering everything. And, um, but then the, the other difficulty is just, you have to narrow down, you have to narrow down to, you know, where you want to adopt from? Um, do you want to adopt um, kids with disabilities? What age and, and all that kind of stuff? And we just you you just have to prayerfully consider all that because every time you check yes or no, you know that you're saying no to somebody, right? You know, and and uh, and so that was very heart and gut wrenching to to go through that process. Mm. But uh, but it ended with uh, us bringing home two beautiful girls, uh, Deleska and Emily and uh, who are now 16 and 12, and they've been with us for just a little over three years. From and, Costa Rica, uh, right? We adopted them from Costa Rica. Um, they didn't know any English when, when we adopted them and went down there. Um, we had to stay in country for about nine weeks, and uh, we came back, and fortunately it was in the summertime, so they had a little time to kind of, you know, get in, mm -hmm. adjust, begin learning some conversational English, and then we started them into school. And, uh, and today they're, they're fluent in English and, and doing really, really well in school. And you remember the cute life. question Emily asked you on Skype? You had one Skype meeting prior to going down there. Yeah. <laughs> so her, her one question in Spanish through the translator was, what happens to me if I do something bad? <laughs> <laughs> she was already thinking ahead uh, uh, what, what her consequences might be. That's gonna and, be revealing uh, about her Yeah, future, so we, we got a very clear sense of her personality yeah. from the beginning, and uh, it is held to be true throughout. That's so so she's, she's definitely kept us on her, our toes. And, uh, and you know, move, going from uh, our youngest at the time, biological daughter, was 15. And so going from a 15-year-old to an 8-year-old, you know, Stacy and I, we had to learn how to parent all over again, yeah, yeah. elementary, uh, elementary age. And mm -hmm. so it takes a lot more energy <laughs> than yeah. what we had it been sure used does. to. So. Well, God's laying something on your heart big time and yeah. you're in for the biggest transition yet, probably, uh, yeah. although adoption is pretty huge. Um, what is it? Yeah. So, um, so, and you said it earlier, um, we've, we've, Often, whenever we feel God calling us to do something, we've, you know, our tendency, uh, speaking in general, is is often to, you know, not sure if that's something we want to do. But Stacy and I, we've always said we want to hold every opportunity with an open hand and not try to say no immediately. And so, um, uh, about two years ago, we were approached about uh, joining the uh, team, missions team uh, in Europe and the Middle East uh, with the Church of God and, and the Mission Agency Global Strategy and working with the Three Worlds team there. And so we are moving to Spain 
and uh, we are going to become the associate regional coordinators for the Church of God in Europe and Middle wow. East, uh, working with the missionary team, the Three Worlds team that's there, um, and then uh, working with the pastors and the churches on the ground um, in about 13 different countries. So, and your whole family's going except for your married son. Yeah, Dylan. yeah. So Dylan just got married, so he'll be he'll be staying back with his bride, and and the uh, Stacy and I, along with our four daughters, will be moving to Madrid. Is it a two year commitment? Is it until the Lord returns? Like, <laughs> what kind of a yeah. commitment is it for you guys, time wise? Because of the role that we're going to yeah. be entering into, we knew it couldn't be a short term thing. Um, and so we, we initially committed to eight to 10 years that we would move, move over there. And, oh my goodness, and Nate, I'm gonna have to come there. see you. I, I know, oh I know. My goodness. there's more places you could come to. Yeah, Spain will be great. <laughs> Nate, God's gonna bless you um, beyond all you can ask or imagine as he always has. I love your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and always open to what's next. I think so many times we get ourselves into what seemed to be a groove, but it ends up becoming a rut. I just appreciate your transparency and authenticity and uh, know you're gonna have great things happen when you go to Madrid. Thank you very much. Although we're gonna miss you. Thank you. One of Nate's uh, favorite Bible verses that he wants to use to be a measuring stick of his faithfulness to God is what Paul wrote at the end of his life to Timothy. It's in 2 Timothy 4, 7. And Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul intentionally uses the imagery of a wrestler, a runner, and a soldier. It was relevant to the culture. And that's what's happened in Nate's life. He wants this whole unbelievable experience with the God of the universe in Christ to be relevant to whomever he locks eyes with. And that's what I want. And that's what God wants for you. So I encourage you for the next week, just pray to God, hey God, what do you want me to do with my life? And be open to a still small voice. Read the Bible this week, maybe memorize uh, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and recite it each day. Pray to God, but allow some time each day to listen, seek wise counsel, maybe go talk to your pastor. Um, it may be just reclaiming where you are for him but it may be to go across the county line, a state line, maybe a border of a country. But I can tell you this, he who has called you will be faithful and he will do it. Thank you so much for joining us on The Restoration Road. Hi, I'm Mitch. Join my good friend, Dr. Sherilyn Emberton, president of Huntington University and me on The Restoration Road next week.